Shalom Mishraka. Welcome to another video from GoyaGroup.com, where we strive to bring everyone into one accord in the worship of Yahuwah Elohim in spirit and in truth. Our channel focuses on removing religious lies to reveal simple spiritual truth so that everyone is armed with the knowledge and understanding on how to faithfully follow the will of the Most High. As always, we will be using Hashem or the name of the Father to bring honor to the Creator and exalt His name as is commanded in the scriptures. Since all of the lies of religion and the corruption of the text are so rampant, this video series will be a smaller version of the material that will be prayerfully be easier to digest. This series continues to focus on verses that are often misunderstood or misused. The 66 book Catholic or Christian Bible has plenty of verses that are obviously mishandled by people, but there are many other verses that are mistranslated or flat out insertions within the text. The focus of this series is on the misunderstanding or misuse of verses in the Bible that could cause salvation issues according to Yashra All or the ancient Israelites, and therefore they must be addressed. To anyone new to the channel, please understand that we absolutely believe in the Most High and His commands, which include His Mashiach or Messiah from the first century CE in Palestine. We do not, however, ascribe to the religious creations based on the faith system of the people from that time who were persecuted and eventually exiled by the Roman Empire. In the past few months, even the past year, honestly, I have witnessed a huge divide amongst my people within the community, and it is saddening. Both men and women seem to be at odds with each other, both passing the blame on the current situation in the black community on the other part. Men are blaming the women for the situation, and women are blaming the men. Look, the children of Yashar all are on a sinking ship, culturally, spiritually, and economically. This is a Titanic-like scenario here, and as this boat sinks, we are arguing over who hit the iceberg, or whose fault it is, rather than trying to get to safety. All other nations have made it to their lifeboats in the same way, shape, or fashion, and although they are still in the open waters, they are not currently drowning. I do not have all the answers for my people. I do not pretend to. And as a man, I cannot speak for women. So I will address the men. Yashra all needs to come together in these perilous times. We need unity. We need to rebuild the family structure that was purposely destroyed by those outside the nation. We need to move forward in faith and in truth to serve our power, as other nations seem to be serving their powers diligently. One huge barrier to all of this is our men often label our women who do not agree with our actions and or our beliefs possessing a rebellious spirit or what is often understood as the Jezebel or Isabel, Isabel spirit that caused them to rebel against their men. This is not to say that our women don't have their issues and are without blame in our current state. However, I'm a man and I will speak to the men. From what I have been witness to, we men have a misconception of how our women should be interacting within the home and how they should behave. This comes from a misconception of a few verses within the 66 book Bible, which leads men to have a misunderstanding of the Asabal spirit and place that accusation on every woman that we deem to be in disagreement or not following our lead in the faith. The complaint is usually that women are not submissive enough or they should be in total submission to their men in all things. We here at Goya Group will address this with two videos. This one, the first, will be about the Bible verses misunderstood and misused to promote this ideal of a Jezebel spirit. And the second will be specifically about what a righteous woman looks like in comparison to a woman who has the Jezebel spirit, according to the text. First of all, the Torah does not speak about a woman being in submission to her husband's or any man. It just isn't in there. To get that doctrine, you have to go to the New Testament. And this thinking is built largely around the letters of Paul of Tarsus and embodied in verses like these. 1 Timothy 2 verses 11 through 12. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Paul is quite clear in his letter to Timothy that a woman needs to learn silently and all submissiveness. And Paul says that he does not allow women to teach or exercise any authority over men. We continue with Ephesians 5 verses 22 to 24. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the master, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Mashiach or Messiah 
is the head of the assembly, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the assembly submits to Messiah, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Paul goes as far as to say that a woman needs to submit to their husbands as if he was the Messiah himself. The man is the head of the household, just as the Messiah is the leader of the assembly. And the woman should submit to her husband in everything. Now, as always, we will put this into historical and geographical context for a better understanding. Both of these letters involve a region called Ephesus. This is evident in the opening verses of the letters. In his letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy verses 1 to 3, Paul, an emissary of Yahusha Mashiach, by the commandment of Elohim, our Savior, and the master Yahusha Mashiach, which is our hope. To Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from Elohim, our Father, and Yahusha Mashiach, our Master. As I besought you to abide still at Ephesus when I went on to Macedonia, that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine. This is also as well in his letter to the Ephesians. Paul, an emissary of Yahushua Mashiach by the will of Elohim, to the Kudushi, set apart, dedicated ones, which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Messiah Yahusha. Clearly, these letters were direct connection with Ephesus. Ephesus is an ancient city in Turkey's central Aegean region near modern day Selkuk. It was a Greek city in antiquity and housed ethnic Greeks as Paul's mission was to the ethnic Gentiles and not the actual children of Yashar'al or the ancient Israelites. This is what Paul is saying to Ephesus, his words and his letters. But what does the Messiah say about Ephesus according to the New Testament? Kazun or Revelation 1.1 The revelation of Yahusha Mashiach which Elohim gave to him to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass and he sent and signified it by his malik or messenger angel to his servant Yachanan. This book is about the revelation of the Messiah. This revelation was given to him by the father and then given to one of his shalukim or emissaries that we call apostles today. Yachanan was relaying this information given to him to the leaders of messengers of several assemblies around the region. In chapter 2 we get to his message to Ephesus. Kazun or Revelation 2.1 To the messenger of the assembly of Ephesus write, These things says he that holds the seven stars in his right hands who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now, that he that holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks in the middle of the seven candlesticks is the vision of the Messiah that Yachanan had as told in chapter 1. Kazun, Revelation 1, verses 12 through 18. And I, meaning Yachanan, turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girdled about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were like, white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they had been burned in a fire or furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance or appearance was as the sun shines in his strength. This son of man was none other than the Messiah, also confirmed by the being Yachanan saw in the same chapter. Verse 18, I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Truly, I have the keys of hell and of death. This is not a Malik as in an angel. No, because those beings are immortal and were never dead according to the text. Lucas or Luke 20 verse 36. Neither can they die anymore for they are equal to the Malachim and are, which is the messengers and angels, and are the children of Elohim being the children of the resurrection. So if you don't die anymore, you're equal to Malachim or messengers because they don't die. This is further evident in how the messengers who transgress against Yah are being held until the great day of judgment because they are immortal beings. 
Yahuda or Jude 1 6. And the Malachim, messengers or angels, which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness to the judgment of the great day. Now, the Messiah died. This is commonly known because he was unlike them, born just like his own people and died like them as well. This also gave him the keys over hell and death, which is referred to back in that earlier verse, which he had previously, which had previously belonged to their mortal devil, according to the text. Abri or Hebrews 2 verses 14 to 18. Therefore, then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, meaning the Messiah, also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily or truly he took not on him the nature of Malachim, meaning messengers or angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like his brothers, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest, or Kuhan Hagadol, in things pertaining to Elohim, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to help them that are tempted. The Messiah was made like his people in every way, which includes his birth, living with temptations, and his eventual death. This allowed him to be able to sympathize with mortals who go through the same things and is why he is given power over death. When we look at his message to the assembly in Ephesus, the people who were Paul's letters were meant to influence, we see this Azabal or Isabel or Jezebel spirit that Paul seemed to be referencing. Kazum or Revelation 2 verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you because you suffered that woman, Azabal or Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, Atzibal or Jezebel had been long dead by this time in history. So this was not actually her that is written of in the Old Testament, but was rather a spirit or archetype that is being referenced here. Could this be what Paul was referencing? Well, that is possible. However, there are some issues here, which is typical for the letters of Paul of Tarsus. First of all, we see that Atzibal or Jezebel spirit that Yahushua was referencing was a woman who called herself a prophetess and was teaching his servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, Paul of Tarsus constantly condemns fornication in his letters. So they are in agreement there, without a doubt. Yet Paul, he has no issue with eating things sacrificed to idols other than it may cause confusion to someone who doesn't know any better which is in contradiction to what was stated by the Messiah and was one of the things that the Messiah held against this assembly that is in Ephesus. We see this in Paul's own writings. 1 Corinthians 8 verses 4 through 10. As concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice to idols, this is our, our subject here, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other than Elohim but one. For though there are those that are called deities, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many deities and many masters. But to us, there is but one Elohim, the Father, of whom all things came, and for whom we live. And one master, Yahusha Mashiach, through whom all came, and through whom we live. However, not all have that knowledge but some being aware of the idol until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. See what he says there, right? But food does not condemn us to not to Elohim for we are none the better if we eat nor are we the worse for not eating. But take heed lest by any means this right of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. 
For if any man sees you, which has knowledge, eating in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him, which is weak, be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? Paul's letter is perfectly clear and coincide with his other writings as well. Paul sees no benefit in what you choose to eat or not to eat. According to Paul, you can totally eat food that has been offered to idols because you have the knowledge that there is only one Elohim and it is only those who are weak that this is a problem for. Paul only warns that those who are weak may see you eating this food offered to idols and see this right you have as an excuse to eat the food offered to idols because that person doesn't have your understanding. Now the Messiah was just as clear. One of his condemnations against Ephesus was that they were eating food offered to idols, plainly. However, Paul says it's okay as long as your intent is good. This is also a direct conflict with the edict at Yerushalayim that he was given by Yaakov Siddiq or James the Just and the other elders of the Nazarenes over the issue of circumcision. Maase or Acts 21-25 But concerning the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded, this is Yaakov Siddiq here, right? James the Just, the Messiah's brother, that they observe no such thing, save only that they, meaning the Gentiles, keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. The conclusion was that Gentiles or foreigners in the faith did not have to be circumcised. However, they had to stay away from things offered to idols. This was the brother of the Messiah who was also an emissary or Shuliak, which was an apostle of the Messiah and was taught directly by the Messiah, explaining what was the good and proper way for the nations to worship in the faith. Paul, who called himself an emissary, disagreed. And this is one of the many conflicts he had with the twelve of the Messiah. When we examine the passage in chapter 2 of Kazun or Revelation, we see that the Essenes or Nazarenes, who do not consider Paul to be a Shuliak or apostle, are validated by the Messiah himself as well. Kazun 2.2 I know your works and your labor and your patience and how you cannot bear them which are evil and you have tried them which say they are shilakim, meaning emissaries or apostles and are not and then found them to be liars. If this information about Paul being considered to be the liar to the 12 is new to you or confusing, please check out our series on Paul as we will have no more time to cover it here. For the purpose of this study, we're just proving that the Atzabal or Isabel spirit, which we call Jezebel spirit, discussed of by the Messiah was one that was at least partially okay with Paul because he saw no problem with eating things offered to idols or eating anything for that matter as long as you knew who the creator was. And since this is the same person who wrote that all women should learn in silence and that no woman should teach as well as being submissive in all things to their husband, we clearly see an issue with his doctrines here. Furthermore, in Paul's letters to the Romans, which was copied by his scribes Tertullus, we see that Paul is actually fine with women teachers in the faith. Romanine or Romans 16, 1 and 2. I commend you, Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the assembly, which is at Sincrea, that you received her in the master as become kudushi or set apart dedicated ones and that you assist her in whatever business she has need of you for she has been a helper of many and of myself also now at first glance these verses may not seem as if there is any contradiction yet when we apply a little textual criticism to the verses the issue becomes obvious this woman phoebe that paul commends the romans is called a servant of the assembly at Sincrea, which was a village in Greece. The word you describe her as a servant is Strong's number G1249. The word is dikanos or deaconos. This is where the word deacon is derived from. Yup, this woman was a deacon or a minister of the assembly in Sincrea. The word literally means, especially a Christian teacher and pastor, technically a deacon or deaconess, deacon, minister, servant. So while translations may decide to use the word servant in the Greek 
which is the let which is what the letter is written in it literally means a deacon or a minister this is why he instructs the recipients of the letter to assist her in any business she has need of them he was giving them a female deacon and they were to support her in her ministry therefore to say a woman must learn in silence and should not teach is a direct contradiction to what he just wrote even in ephesus there were women that were students of paul or taught by him who were teaching which is a direct contradiction of the passage about women not teaching that we see when continuing to read the same chapter in Romans. Verses 3 and 4 of Romans 16. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Mashiach Yahusha or the Messiah Yahusha, who have for my life laid down their own necks, to whom I not only give thanks, but also to all the assembly of the Gentiles. This Priscilla and Aquila were the same ones who were recorded as students of Paul, and they are directly and they directly taught a Yehudi man who was in the walk of the Messiah in the Book of Acts, Maase 19:18 to 28, or Acts 19:18 to 28. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brothers, and then sailed to Syria, and with them Priscilla and Aquila having shaved his head in Sancria, for he had a vow, the vow of the Nazarene, obviously. And he came to Ephesus uh -huh, and left them there. But he himself entered into the congregation or synagogue and reasoned with the Yehudi. When they desired him to stay with them for a longer time, he declined. But he bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that comes in Jerusalem or Jerusalem. But I will return again to you if Elohim will. And he sailed from Ephesus. Paul had his helpers or students Priscilla and Aquila accompany him on his journeys. Paul had taken a vow of the Nazarene in which he had to shave his head in Sencria, which is the same Greek city that the deacon Phoebe was from in the verses from Romans 16. Paul and these ladies arrived in Ephesus and he left them there so that he could go on to a festival in Jerusalem. These women whom Paul left in Ephesus also taught there. Verses 24 here. And a certain Yehudi named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and a mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the master and being fervent in the spirit he spoke and taught diligently the things of the master, knowing only the baptism of Yachanan, which is John, John the Baptist. And he began to speak boldly in the congregation or synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him aside and explained to him the way of Elohim more perfectly. Now, these women who learned under Paul and were praised by Paul in his letter to the Romans, were now teaching men. Were they not following Paul's instructions? Were they wicked? If so, why were they praised by Paul? The simple answer is they were not, and they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. According to the narrative, this man Apollos was able to use these teachings given to them by these women in order to refute the Yehudi who were in error and convince people of the Messiah. Verse 28, for he, meaning Apollos, mightily convinced the Yehudi and that publicly showed by the scriptures that Yahusha was Mashiach or Messiah. The fact is that Paul might not even have meant that women in general should not teach and could have honestly been speaking of a particular woman or a specific situation as was discussed by the Messiah in Kazun 2 verse 20. Or Paul could have just contradicted what he said there as he does in some of his other letters. Either way, no one can say for sure today. What we can say, no one should look at those letters of Paul and make the determination that women cannot teach and must learn in silence. This is definitely a salvation issue here because some women may have meaningful information necessary for salvation. And if you ignore it based on a contradictory letter here, then you could miss this message. The concept of women not teaching men also flies in the face of the Torah or Tanakh as well. Shaphatim or rulers and judges 4-4 and Deborah or Deborah, a prophetess, uh -huh, the wife of Lapudus, 
she judged Yahshua all or Israel at that time. Now, this woman, Deborah or Deborah, is designated as a prophetess. In Hebrew, this is Strong's H5031, Nabiah, pronounced Nabiah, a prophetess or generally inspired woman by implication, a uh, poetess. She was the feminine form of a prophet, which is a Nabi. Now, the text is clear that one should listen to a prophet. So should the men have ignored her because she was a woman? Hmm. Furthermore, she is also described as judging Yasharal or ancient Israel. The word used for that is Strong's H8199. The book of Judges is actually Shofatim or Judges in the plural, pronounced Shafat, right? It is a primitive root to judge, i.e. pronounce sentence for or against by implication to vindicate or punish by extension to govern passively or to litigate literally or figuratively, right? To be a Shafat means to be a ruler or someone who rules, governs, or judges, which is why the book is also called Rulers. This woman was married. She had a husband, yet she still functioned in a ruling capacity. This doesn't mean that it is cultural for women to rule in Yashra all, and this is easily proven by reading what Josephus wrote about the situation. In Antiquities 552, lines 200 to 201, so when at length they will become penitent and were wise as to learn that their calamities arose from their contempt of the laws, they besought Deborah, a certain prophetess among them, which name in the Hebrew tongue signifies a bee, to pray to Elohim and to take pity on them and not to overlook them as they were ruined by the Canaanites. So Elohim granted them a deliverance and chose them a general, Barak, one that was of the tribe of Naphtali. Now, Barak in the Hebrew tongue signifies lightning. So we see that to be a judge or a ruler simply meant to be an intermediary between the father and the people and one who prays on behalf of the people. She was not a ruler in the sense of a king, but was one in the sense of a leader in the faith. This means that historically, a woman can most assuredly teach in the faith and it would not be leading men in terms of war because Barak was the leader of the military. And this is evident in the end of the chapter. Same chapter, same book, line 209. Barak overthrew the city uh, to the foundation and was the commander of the Yashra Ali or Israelites for 40 years. So we clearly see that Deborah or Deborah was the leader in the faith as a woman, yet the leader of the men militarily was Barak, and he ruled as the leader for 40 years. We see the same sentiment when we look into Yahusha or Yushaya, who was the righteous boy king of Yashraal. Malachim Beit or 2 Kings 22, verse 1 and verse 2. Yushaya or Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem or Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Yadiyah or Jedidiah, the daughter of Adiyah or Adiyah, of Boskath or Boskath, however you want to pronounce that. And he did that which was right in the sight of Yahuwah and walked in all the ways of Dawood or David, his father, and turned not aside to the right or to the left. This king began ruling when he was just eight years old and was of the lineage of Dawood and his mother of the lineage of Adia. So his lineage was impeccable and was recorded as not going aside to the right or to the left, meaning he walked the straight and narrow path to serve Yahuwah. This king, when he was 18 years old, had his scribe go to the high priest about a matter of the silver that those who do the work at the temple was receiving. And when his scribe went to the high priest, the priest told him, they found a Torah. Verse 8. And Kilikiah, Kuhan Hagadol, or Hilikiah, the high priest, said to Shaphiah, the scribe, I have found the book of the Torah, or the law, in the house of Yahuwah. And Kilikiah gave the book to Shaphar, and he read it. Then the scribe gave the Torah to the young king, who read it, 
and tore his clothes because he understood that they were not doing what was commanded of them. Verse 11 reads, And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the book of the Torah, or the law, he rent or tore his clothes. And the king commanded that Kilikiah, Hakuhan, or Hilikiah the high priest, and Akim, or Akim, the son of Shaphan, and Akbar, the son of Mikiah, and Shaphan, the scribe, and Asiah, a servant of the king, saying, You go, inquire of Yahuwah for me, and for the people, and for all of Yahudah, or Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of Yahuwah that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened to the words of this book, to do according to all that which was written concerning us. This righteous king, who did not alter from the straight and narrow way, instructed the high priests as well as the scribes to go and find out what they needed to do according to the word of Yah. He wanted to be taught which was needed for the sake of his people. The high priest, who was a man, mind you, went to the most learned person of that time to be taught the proper ways of Yah to put the people back on the proper path. What they find? They found a woman. Verse 14. So Kikiyah, Hakuhan, and Akam, and Akbar, and Shaphan, and Asiyah went to Kolda Hanabiah, or Holda the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikba, the son of Harkas, the keepers of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Yerushalayim in the college, and they communed with her. They went to a woman who was the prophetess at that time. This woman was married and studied at the college or center of learning in Yerushalayim. This proves plainly that women learned and were teaching as this woman taught the high priest as well as the king as to what they needed to do to stay on the path. Again, this can all be found in historical document of antiquities by Josephus. Antiquities 10, 4, 2, lines 58 through 61. He also read over the books to him, who when he, meaning Yushaya or Josiah, had heard them, read, he rent his garment, same thing you read in the Bible, and called for Alakim, the high priest, and for Shaphan, the scribe, and for certain other of his most particular friends, and sent them to Calda, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, which Shalom was a man of great dignity and of eminent family, and bid them to go to her and say that he desired she would appease Elohim and endeavor to render him prophetess to them. For there was cause to fear lest upon transgression of the laws of Musha by their forefathers, they should be in peril of going into captivity and being cast out of their own country, lest they should be in want of all things and so end their days miserably. When the prophetess heard of this, from the messengers that were sent to her by the king, she bid them to go back to the king and say that Elohim had already given sentence against them to destroy the people and cast them out of their country and deprive them of all the happiness they enjoyed, which sentence none could set aside by any prayers of theirs, since it was passed on account of their transgressions of the laws and of their not having repented in so long a time while the prophetess has exhorted them to amend and had foretold the punishment that would ensue on their impious practices, which threatened Elohim, which threatening Elohim would certainly execute upon them that they might be persuaded that he is Elohim and had not deceived them in any respect as to what he had denounced by his prophets, that yet because Yushia, meaning Josiah, was a righteous man, he would at present delay those calamities. But after his death, he would send on the multitude what miseries he had determined for them. So as stated, the most learned person at the time was a woman, a prophetess named Kolda, and she instructed the king and the high priest what was going to happen and why it was going to happen. This woman had a husband, and was under a high priest, which was irrelevant when it comes to the word of Yah. Her husband was the head of her house and gave these men permission and told them, go to her and figure out what you need to do, right? 
She was the one who had to teach the truth to the men. Yushaya was a righteous man and seeking a woman for understanding was the right thing to do in this case because a woman was the one who had the understanding and the knowledge. This is most definitely a salvation issue because the Bible says that in the days of reconciliation for his people that it will be the sons and the daughters who will receive the Ruach. This is recorded in UR or Joel 2:28 to 29 and it shall to come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my Ruach or spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. In those days will I pour out my Ruach. This is even repeated in Acts in relation to the Ruach HaKadosh that was the spirit of truth to teach all mankind. Maasi or Acts 2 verses 16 to 17. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet you all. They're quoting him. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says Elohim, I will pour out my Ruach upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. We as men have got to stop conflating ruling our homes or our houses with the faith. They're not mutually exclusive. You can have a righteous man leading his house who must be instructed by a woman in the faith and the Torah as well as the historical record from the Bible bears this out. If we continue to try and silence our woman we may very well miss pertinent information, which can cause us to miss the mark. Misunderstanding or misusing letters of Paul or any verse in the Bible can be a detriment to our people. We need to teach our sons and our daughters that they are worthy of the Ruach and can share the understandings with their family as it is written. This was the first part of the study and the next part will be about exactly what is the Azabal or Isabel spirit, which we call the Jezebel spirit scripturally, so that we can accurately identify what it is. As always, I thank you for your time. Shalom.